be opening up the second Timothy. Second Timothy is where we'll be taking our lesson from this morning. It is so good to be with you. This is the first time that I've ever ventured into the state of Mississippi to preach the gospel. So this is a new area for me. So please bear with me. I'm just a native Alabamian. Don't hold that against me. Because at the very best, I'm your brother in Christ. And at the very least, I'm a native Alabamian. So, you know, we, we kind of cherish one another here because we, we're just going south. Well, I appreciate it so much, your kind invitation. And, and this morning, I want us to talk about a variety of things. But in the outset, uh, on July the 29th of this year, I found myself sitting in Hobby Airport down in Houston by myself. I was making my way down to Belize for a week of preaching and teaching for the brethren down there. And as I was traveling, I had to travel by myself this trip just because of various things. And I was not meeting those who I was going with until I got to Belize itself. But while I was sitting there, I had already been up early, early that morning for a flight from Birmingham to Hobby. And then was going from Houston down to Belize City. And I had about a four or five hour layover. And one of those things that happens to you when you You've already got up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you never get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, or at least I don't. And, and then you're sitting there and you're kind of, you're just wasting the time. You begin to think about things. And what I begin to think about is I begin to think about my life. And just thinking about, here I am, I'm about to go across the seas, or at least I'm going across the Gulf of Mexico. I'm going to be away from my family if something was to happen to me. And, and it just, it, it's kind of some morbid thoughts go through your mind. And, and I'm trying not to be... So down right here at the beginning of a meeting, but yet some morbid things go through your mind and you begin to think and, and you pray that, Lord, you know, protect my wife, be watchful over her, be with my children as I'm away from them. And if it is your will, let me come back to them. I think about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul in the first letter to Timothy and first Timothy and then even in the letter that he wrote to the Philippians, it's readily available to us. That are evident to us, excuse me, that, that Paul understood that that first Roman imprisonment was not going to bring about his utter demise. It seems that Paul had an anticipation that he was going to be able to come back to the brethren in Philippi, come back to his brother in the faith, Timothy. But then when we open up 2 Timothy, Paul encounters a different spirit about himself. If you look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, it is there that, that Paul says to Timothy, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Timothy now, or excuse me, Paul has come to the realization that my life, physically, is shortly going to come to an end. And as such, what Paul does for Timothy, and now what he does for even us in the 21st century, what Paul does for Timothy in this final epistle is he gives to him five keys to guarding the treasure. You come back with me now to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and read with me the verses 13 and 14. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. Here it is that Paul writes, he says, Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me and the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. So here, Paul is giving to him his expectations first in verse 13 to retain the standard of sound words, to retain the standard of the doctrine of the faith that has been delivered to you, Timothy. You take that word and you retain it. That is, that you hold it up, that you are steadfast in it, that you continue to grow and mature in that. But then in verse 14, Paul emphasizes in, in yet another level. He says, but guard the treasure that is within you. Guard the gospel. And what I want us to do is I just want us to step through this short epistle that Paul wrote, that final epistle that he wrote to Timothy. And as we step through this short epistle, we're just going to look at five things that Paul emphasizes to his son in the faith, Timothy, to help him to guard the treasure that was within him. The first step that he needed to take, it should have been that these are coming up one at a time, but it appears they're coming up this one at least twice. But the first step that the Apostle Paul expects of his son in the faith to guard the treasure that is within him is that he is to be satisfied with the gospel. Satisfied with the gospel. Come back with me to chapter 1 and look with what Paul says to him in verse 8. Chapter 1 and verse 8, Paul says, Therefore do not be ashamed 
of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in the suffering of, for the gospel according to the power of God. The first thing that Paul emphasizes here to his son in the faith is that he is to be satisfied with the gospel. He says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Do not be ashamed. Does that not remind you of another memory verse that you have from the Apostle Paul? In Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, when Paul says there, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, when he says, For I am not ashamed of the, or of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile or to the Greek. Paul had that sense about him. He had that heart attitude that I am not ashamed of the gospel. And here at the conclusion of his physical life, as he continues to encourage his son in the faith to live on and to, and to prosper spiritually, he says the same thing to him. Timothy, you cannot be ashamed of the gospel. You need to be satisfied in the gospel. And the reason we need to find satisfaction in the gospel, look at verse 10 of chapter 1. In verse 10, he says, But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished <coughs> death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Why should we never be ashamed of the gospel? And why should we always be satisfied by the gospel? Because what the gospel does for us, it takes us from death to life. It is abolished death. Brethren, when you think about the society that surrounds you right now, the greatest fear of so many people who live today is death. And they're doing everything they can to escape it. But we freely acknowledge that death is before each one of us minus Jesus' return. And if death is before us, we are preparing ourselves for that fateful day so that when it does occur, whenever it does occur, that we will be found ready. That we are satisfied with the gospel that Jesus has given to us through his death, burial, and resurrection. So that by that we can be resurrected. That we can be raised anew. And that we can be a Christian and a faithful one at that. Paul was confident in this gospel. Look at verse 12 of chapter 1. Look at the confidence that Paul has here. He says, for this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. Paul, why are you not ashamed? Because I know in whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted into him until that day. Paul says, I know, I believe, I am convinced, and I am entrusted into him. See, see Paul was satisfied with the gospel. The Apostle Paul did not need anything else from this world. He did not seek anything else from this world. But what he had in Jesus Christ, that was sufficient for Paul. And brethren, that needs to be sufficient for each one of us. We need to find our satisfaction in the gospel. And, and brethren, if you ever find yourselves beginning to wane or ever find yourselves beginning to lack that confidence, to lack that hope, to lack that satisfaction... What you need to do is you need to look at others. Look at the examples that Paul gives to Timothy here in chapter 1. Look back to verse 5. Look back to verse 5 of chapter 1. He says, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt where? In your grandmother Eunice, or Lois, excuse me, in your mother Eunice. And I am sure that it is in you as well. So let me say this, if you ever find your satisfaction at one point in time and you've become a Christian, you've been baptized into Christ, but yet because of the years of life and because of the hard trials that life brings upon you, you begin to feel yourself becoming ashamed of the gospel instead of being, instead of being satisfied by the gospel, look to your others, look to your family members, look to your grandmother and your grandparents, look to your mother and your father, look to your brothers and sisters in Christ. I take you back to verse 13. What did Paul say there? Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me. Timothy, if you ever become ashamed, remember who I am. Remember the mantle that I took upon myself and I've been carrying all these years. And you imitate me as I imitate Christ, as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. So the first thing that we need to do to guard the treasure that is within us is to be satisfied 
with the gospel. The second, as you already have on the screen, is to suffer. And we've already seen that in verse uh, 10. We've already seen that back in verse 8, where Paul says, Do not be ashamed, but join with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. But turn with me to chapter 2. In chapter 2, look at what Paul says to us in verse 3. Paul says, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. You see, brethren, what suffering does for us as Christians is it makes us become more like the one who has saved us. When we suffer for the sake of Christ, it makes us more like him. Think about how Jesus concluded the Beatitudes. Turn back with me to Matthew chapter 5. Turn back with me to Matthew chapter 5 and look at what Jesus says here at the conclusion of the sermon or the conclusion of the Beatitudes. He says in verse 10, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who have been persecuted. Blessed are those who have suffered for my name's sake, for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And continuing on from there in verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. And in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are becoming more like the prophets and you are becoming more like me. In Acts chapter 5, if you remember with me, the apostles uh, there were arrested and they were brought in. And, and Gamaliel finally spoke some wise words to the committee or the council who was wanting to, to kill these apostles. But ultimately in verse 40, they brought them in, they flogged them, and then they dispersed them, telling them to preach no longer in the name of Jesus. And in Acts chapter 5 and verse 41, take a note of that verse. Acts 5 and verse 41, and note how they responded to their suffering. They worshiped, they praised God because they were considered worthy of being suffering for Christ's name. Brethren, I have a very important question I want to ask you this morning. Because of the environment that surrounds us, because of everything that has happened in these past few years and few decades, have we gone to such an extent of protecting our physical lives that it is possible that we have possibly, just understanding, that we have possibly gone so far that, it, that we are no longer willing to suffer for the sake of Christ? Have we drove the spectrum and the pendulum so far to the opposite direction for to, to protect ourselves that we're no longer willing to accept suffering? Brother, I think that's a serious question that we need to ask ourselves, especially in 21st century America. Are we willing to go so far that we're no longer willing to suffer for the sake of Christ? What did Jesus say in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12? Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And understand, brethren, when he says in chapter 2 and verse 3 to suffer... To suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. What Paul is emphasizing to Timothy is not that you are a soldier in the sense that you are a part of an army that has physical arms. And with those physical armament that you are able to protect yourselves. No, we have been called to a spiritual army. Go and read 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 through 3 and ask yourselves what type of, of weapons are, what type of weaponry are we given as soldiers of Christ. And understand that this is a common theme throughout these two short epistles that Paul writes to Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18, fight the good fight of faith. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3, suffer the hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, Paul says to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. This is emphasized throughout these epistles. Paul emphasizing this attitude, this heart attitude that we need to have to be willing to suffer for the sake of Christ. Pressing on, the third is that we need to be good students of his word. 
2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, you probably already know that verse, do you not? In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. That is that when you open up your word of God, that when you open up the Bible, you understand where you're opening it up to. Now I tell you, there are some black holes in my Bible. I don't know if I'm as you or you are as I am. But there's some books, there's some passages that I'll just open up to sometimes and I'm just like, I'm lost. What do I need to do? I need to spend some time in the Word of God, don't I? How many of you know the 12 minor prophets? I don't think that's probably a major black hole for many of us, isn't it? It's those 12 short books at the end of the Old Testament that hardly we ever read. But brethren, if you want to understand the society that surrounds you, the difficulties that you may face, and how to overcome those difficulties, go and read the book of Amos. Go and read the book of Micah. Go and read Hosea, Joel, or any of the others. Because guess what? They faced difficult times and difficult situations. And how they overcame is through the prophecies that God gave them to speak. And it still speaks to us today. But we need to be good students of the Word of God. And as being good students of the Word of God, there's a couple of things that Paul tells us here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that we need to avoid. And in verse 14 and in verse 16, he tells us. And isn't it interesting, in verse 15, he tells us to be a good student of the Word of God. But look at verse 14. What do we need to avoid? He says, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God, not... To wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to destruction or the ruin of hearers. Look at verse 16. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. We need to escape the vocabularies of this world by studying the word of God. Verse 15. You change your vocabulary by the things by which you bring in. If the words that you are saying out of your mouth are contrary to the will of God, what you're lacking then is the will of God. You've got to ingest more of it so that it is what directs your heart and keeps your heart from sin. But let me just give one word of warning or, or caution here in verses 14 and 16. If there was something that exists today that would have existed in the time of Paul, I think he could have readily, and, and please take that this is my opinion, but I believe he could have readily exchanged the, this idea of wrangling about words and, and avoid worldly and empty chatter. He could have taken that out and he could have put in its place social media. Social media. Charging them to the presence of God not to wrangle on social media. Verse 16, but avoid social media. And brethren, I, I know that it's, it, it does not escape you because it does not escape any of us anywhere. It doesn't matter if you live in Florence, Belize, Corinth. It does not matter where you live. Social media is a platform and it is used by the world and it is used by the devil. It can be used for great things such as broadcasting and sowing the seed and watering. it. Absolutely. I'm not degrading it at all in those facts. Brethren, you know as well as I how many times have you ever got on the social media and you've seen a post, whether it be encouraging, a post, whether it be just a, just a, a brief a, a paragraph about what God's doing in somebody's life and then immediately following from that, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments and most of them are negative. And then there's just backbiting in the comments and this person says this and it's taking the wrong way and then this person comes up and... That's exactly what Paul's telling Timothy to avoid, but yet we jump headlong into it. We have to get rid of these things. We have to be a student of God's word. That's the first thing, avoid empty chatter. The second thing, we have to avoid worldly living. Look at verse 19. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having the seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. We avoid worldly chatter. We avoid worldly living. Brethren, if we want to be the person that God would desire us to be, this is the type of attitude, this is the type of heart that we need to have. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. 
but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. Verses 24 and 25 of this same chapter. <coughs> That's what I am to be exhibiting in my life. Kindness, gentleness. You think about the world in which we live, brethren, we cannot escape it, can we? It is a harsh reality. And for all these young people that I'm looking at right now, guys and young ladies, y'all are facing a world that is vastly different from the, from the high school days that I faced 20 years ago. And I know it's vastly different from those that are a little bit older than me and a little bit older than them. It is a different world that you guys are facing. But if you will put the word of God into your hearts and if you will live by the word of God every single day of your lives, guess what? The world will not win in your life. You can affect the change. You be the light. You be the factor of change. Moving quickly, we come to the fourth, and that is that we need to be settled. Let me say it this way. And I, I know that you're saying, well, satisfied and settled seems to be the same thing. But I, I need to emphasize something different with settled. And that is that we are settled. That we are confidently assured that the word of God is exactly what it proclaims to be. The word of God. Again, skeptics every single day are getting on social media platforms, are getting on the internet, which is, a, again, is a, a scary thing. Google has made things way too easy for us. If you don't know something, just Google it, right? And unfortunately, when somebody has a spiritual question, instead of going to somebody who is spiritually minded, they go to Google. And what Google broadcasts to them is, is the world's answer. To whatever that spiritual question may be. But brethren, do not allow it to escape your notice. That what you have in your hands right now is the most precious gift that you've ever been given. And that's the word of God. Its value is above much fine gold. That's what the psalmist David wrote in Psalm 19. And what you have right here is the mind of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10. What you have right here is God breathed words. All scripture is inspired by God and it is profitable for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17. We have the word of God. Man may attack it. Man may try to degrade it. Man may try to tell you that you don't have the word of God. You don't have the autographs. You don't have the authentic. But brethren, rest assured what we have in evidence that this is the word of God given to us by, him, by God himself is absolutely overwhelming in our favor. Whatever the world may throw against us, it will not stick and it will not stand. But this will last for all eternity. Be settled upon that fact. You have the word of God. Cherish it. Dwell in it. Meditate upon it daily. And then fast, finally, the fifth key to guarding the treasure that is within us is to spread the word. We do not have a monopoly of the truth. We do not have it to all to ourselves. But rather what God has given to us, he expects then for us to give to others. Look at what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Now remember, he's, he's told Timothy in verse 13 of chapter 1 to retain. And in verse 14 to guard. But look at what Timothy is expected to do in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. He says, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. And trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach Others also. What was Timothy expected to do with the word that he had been given by Paul? To sit on it? To rest upon his laurels? To keep it all to himself? He was to take that faithful word that Paul had entrusted into him and entrust it to others. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, the judge who, the, who will be the judge of the living and the dead, by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with great patience and instruction. 2 Timothy 4 verses 1 and 2. What was Paul's expectation of Timothy? 
preach the word. Now, yes, this morning, what we are doing right now is preaching the word audibly. We are all <laughs> listening to the word being taught. But understand that that's not the only way in which we can preach the word. You preach the word by the actions that you carry out on a daily basis, whether it be at work or at school. When you choose not to run with the masses, when you choose to live that holy lifestyle, when you choose not to talk like everybody else talks, when you choose to be the influence and to be the change that God has called you to be, you are thereby in your life living that out. And when people see that, they are motivated to be the change also. Spread the word. And always remember, it is not he who sows and it is not he who waters, but it is God who gives the increase. Second Corinthians 3. Or first Corinthians chapter 2, excuse me. So finally we come to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And at verse 6, once again. Paul understands his time on earth is coming to a short end. And as his life is coming to an end, he is trying to pour out his soul to his son in the faith, Timothy. He is trying to teach Timothy. Timothy, these are the things that I desire of you. These are the things that if you will put into action on a daily basis, if that you will be satisfied with the gospel, if you are willing to suffer with the gospel, if you are willing to be a student of the gospel and settle upon the gospel, firmly affirming that it is the gospel, the one and only gospel, and then if you'll take that gospel and spread it, if you'll do these things, Timothy, this, is what will be given to you. Verse 7 beginning. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day. And not only to me. But also to all. Who have loved his appearing. What will be given to Timothy if he applies these things in his life? What did Paul say? A crown of righteousness. And brethren, if that would have been true for Timothy, could it be true for you and me? If we'll put these five things into action in our lives, whenever that day appears, when our Heavenly Father sends His Son to retrieve us, what we will be given is a crown of righteousness. That's the five things that we need to do to guard the treasure that is within us this morning. And every day that so that we so do. I appreciate so much your kind attention in this first hour. <clears throat>